It is 2.05. I want to welcome our audience. Thank you all for being here. We have an exciting panel to uh, uh, share with you today. Um, today, we're going to be talking about some valuable insights in the world of vocational rehabilitation, sometimes overlooked. And granted, we all uh, don't get paid for it. The, uh, the work that happens when it comes to vocational rehabilitation, but we want to talk about some strategies and specifically uh, referral sources and that being very important. Your injured workers uh, getting uh, taken care of after their case, it's, uh, it, it works well for, for referrals. I'm sure you, go, you all can agree. Um, I want to introduce our panelists. First uh, um, is our good friend Moises Vasquez. Uh, Moises Vasquez is a personal injury and workers' compensation uh, attorney out of Whittier. He's been practicing since 1983, a graduate of Loyola University and UCLA School of Law. He's also a founding mem member of Latino Comp. Um, also, I want to introduce uh, attorney Anthony Ratto. From Ant uh, Anthony Ratto has dedicated himself to presenting injured workers, uh, representing injured clients in workers' compensation and personal injury cases in jury and bench trials. He is the founder and the principal of Rattle Law Firm PC, which has become one of the most successful workers' compensation law firms in Northern California and the San Francisco Bay Area. Mr. Rattle represents clients throughout California before the Supreme Court, the California Court of Appeals, United States District Court, and the Workers' Compensation Appeal Board, as well as private mediation and arbitration proceedings. Um, also, we have our very own Nadia Dow, Gemini's Legal Vocational Rehabilitation Counselor. Originally from New York City, gradu Nadia graduated from Arizona State University on a full academic scholarship. She has served as manager of the Voucher Counseling Service Division at Gemini Legal since 2018. She works with all pertinent parties in the workers' compensation process and remains current on legislative change and their impact on providers. <laughs> Um, I'm your host. I'm your uh, moderator. My name is Dan Mora. I am the founder and CEO of Gemini Legal. Thank you all for your participation. Um, for our audience, I want to let you know we're monitoring the chat. So if you do have any questions or would like follow up, we are very happy to do that for you. So first, what we're going to do is talk about um, the value of good voucher experience for your clients. And I want to have Mr. Ratto and Nadia Dow talk about how um, how you can help your clients, how your help, how your the voucher experience for your clients is helped to your law firm. Mr. Ratto. Thanks, Dan. So, uh, as some of us might remember, in 2003, they uh, did away with the old vocational rehabilitation system that we had, and put in place a, a voucher system. So, for dates of injury beginning January 1, 2004 and continuing from then, uh, workers get a supplemental job displacement benefit, which we call a non-transferable voucher, or most people just call it the voucher. Uh, there are two periods of time that we'll be discussing today. Uh, those dates of injury from 2004 to January 1, 2013, and then from January 1, 2013 on. Uh, most of us are probably at this point handling primarily 2013 cases and, and, and continuing. Uh, but uh, since there's a lot of confusion uh, that can develop between the different sm little small qualifications and different changes in the law, uh, we're going to go over uh, all of that. Um, but like Dan said, before we get started, uh, we we're going to have Nadia uh, explain how 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 she has found uh, the experience uh, going for her to, when handling her clients with uh, the use of vouchers and basically uh, the surprising benefit that uh, our clients get. So Nadia, uh, what has been your experience? Uh, it's been phenomenal, actually. I was a bit concerned that COVID would put a damper on the educational portion for our clients and contemplating whether or not we were going to try and see if we can extend classes. Thank goodness online classes has been really advantageous. Um, currently we're experiencing that 86.9% uh, of all the vouchers that we receive are being utilized, which is very exciting. 
Uh, and I think it's definitely up to the law firm and who they partner with to identify what strategies to um, explore with the client as far as vocational objectives, taking into consideration all the important things that we do, such as educational background, monolingual Spanish capabilities, injuries, work restrictions, geographical locales. So it's very exciting. Yeah, so when, when we were preparing for this uh, presentation, when you told me that 87% of our workers are, are actually getting the vouchers and you, you, you utilizing them for educational purposes, uh, as you know, I was, I was really kind of blown away by that. Uh, the kind of the feedback I usually get is, ah, no one really uses the voucher, blah, blah, blah. You know, and they all hear about the, the $5,000 return to work fund. Um, but the voucher itself, it, it's great to hear that people are taking advantage of that. In terms of uh, the type of schooling that they get and how they use the vouchers, what are some of the benefits that they, they're able to take advantage of? So if they're utilizing the $6,000 voucher, and this is, you know, again, whoever your law office partners with, it's really important to have a counselor and a good team that's going to fight the individual for the next phase in life. And so underneath the $6,000 voucher, aside from the $5,000 RQW benefit, they're entitled to $1,000 post-2013, we're talking about now. Yeah. And you're going to catch me on that post-2013. They're entitled to the $1,000 for reimbursement of computer and or related. And they're entitled to the 500 miscellaneous. So, I mean, there's a lot of goodies to be able to take advantage of under that voucher. And as far as the training programs, uh, it just depends on their novel and where they see their next step going. We've got, we uh, work with every single post-secondary accredited school. So I think it's important when law offices are partnering with a counseling firm, you know, uh, we always get posed the question, what schools are you working with? Well, we're working with every single post-secondary accredited school. And we're actually uh, taking advantage of uh, strategizing and identifying more and more and more that are uh, up to date and very exciting for the injured worker to participate in because not everybody comes from the same path in life. Mm. So let's get over to that one special goodie, the $5,000 return to work fund. What, what, explain in a nutshell what that is and, and uh, how that works. So the return to work benefit, uh, it, it's, it's an actual $5,000 allocated by the state. And it's in a fund that assists the injured worker who is not able to return to their UN. Perhaps maybe they need extra help with rent, Ask, whatever it is, it's an extra assistance that has been provided to kind of uh, financial relief to the injured worker. Okay. And, and that's something that uh, I know when we, ref we uh, conclude a case, we refer uh, you know, our clients who have vouchers to people like yourself to uh, get assistance in, in uh, 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 getting, that, that, getting that access to that fund. Yes. Um, is that something that you uh, do for your clients? Absolutely. Again, any law firm who is uh, working with any counseling firm, the first thing that that counseling firm can do to take care of the client is to process the RTW. It's a time-sensitive fund, and you never know what's going to transpire, as you know, Anthony. So you want to take advantage of it and process it immediately to assist the client in every way possible. Yeah. So uh, uh, thank okay. you. So one one point one point that I wanted to make about uh, uh, just a sort of a uh, practice pointer, let's call it, is that when uh, when I'm set. When I'm settling, you there, Dan? Oh. When I'm settling a, a case, I I make a point of not promising my client that they're going to get this five thousand dollar voucher. Uh, I, as attorneys, you know the the we know that the voucher is not part of the settlement agreement per se. Uh, we can't enforce it with at the board, uh, and so I make a point to tell my clients that look, it, you know, you you're going to settle your case. You're getting a voucher. Uh, the voucher makes you eligible to apply for the $5,000 return to work fund uh, uh, money. 
uh, and that we will refer you to an uh, appropriate counselor who, who can not only assist you with the use of the voucher, but also can assist you to access that money. Um, you know, and there's some dicey questions about uh, who may be eligible for uh, the $5,000, and uh, especially Moises is uh, going to go over some of those issues with, with us today. Um, am I still there? Because I'm getting a note saying my internet is unstable. I can hear you pretty well on my end. Nadia, uh, panel, okay, good. The so, techies are having a little bit of a hard time hearing you. You can just speak right in your computer and a little bit louder than the attendees will be able to hear you a little bit better. Sure, absolutely. Thank you. So, yeah, I mean, you uh, know, I so, from the attorney point of view why you wouldn't want to say that because if the uh, client has an MIA and there is a time sensitivity in that one year, uh, you don't want to necessarily say that. But again, it is a fund yeah. that every injured worker post 2013 is entitled to. And so, therefore, the first thing that I would recommend any counseling firm that you're working with would be to process that immediately as soon as you get that client on board so that that client also has that alleviation. Many times when you're thinking about the 1,000 and the 500, for example, under the 6,000, they're like, gee, that's great, but I don't have the money now. I don't have the money out of pocket to be able to buy that computer. So if you expedite the RTW, now you're giving them the opportunity to be able to get those monies sooner than later so that they can pay out of pocket for that computer or for that related item in a time sensitive uh, way. Yeah. Yeah. So, uh, and so it's two things to remember about the return to work fund is that it applies to cases post January, 2013 date of injury and that it's not just automatically included in the client's settlement. It's something they need to apply for and they have to do that within one year from the date of issuance of the voucher. So, uh, and as you'll see, you know, these two post-2013 vouchers, they don't necessarily get issued at the end of a case. They can get issued uh, during the uh, pendency of the case. So it's something to keep in mind. Uh, in, 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 that right, regard, so let's get, in that regard, if I can pipe in, uh, when you come into a case where an applicant's been in per, per for a while, you need to make sure about that voucher issue. We've had some cases where they've given the applicant the voucher like they're supposed to right after that first PNS report. And the client goes, uh, they went back to work or they just sat on their rights for a while and they come to see you a year later, year and a half later, and they may not even tell you about the voucher, you need to inquire. We've had a couple cases where we inquired and the voucher had been issued like a year and a half before, where we were able to get them in the pipeline to get something done. We've had other cases where they've come after two years that the voucher has been issued and we've had problems getting the voucher reissued uh, by the carriers. They won't do it. And I have one case where I'm litigating that issue. But. Right. Correct. Well, that affects the RTW right. and the client uh, can potentially lose out on that $5,000. Okay. So um, a a another point that we need to be aware of is that, you know, we're talking about vouchers. We're not talking about uh, qualified injured workers. Uh, uh, getting a voucher has nothing to do with being a qualified injured worker under the, the old system. That, that language is is antiquated and, and uh, really not useful anymore. Uh, we still see evaluators who include, you know, uh, that our clients are QIW in their reports, but I think they more or less just do that out of uh, old habits. So we're not talking about anything to do with QIW here. So what the, ne the next thing is to address, so what qualifies your client uh, to receive a voucher? So there's two, uh, uh, two time periods that we were talking about. And so for the pre-January 1, 2013 cases, uh, the, there's basically uh, three, three, three requirements that, that the injured worker has to, to meet. Uh, the first requirement is that the injured worker uh, must be suffering from permanent disability. And uh, the next is that uh, there's a time a uh, period of 30 days following the ending of temporary disability payments 
where the employer must offer a qualifying job to the worker and failure to do that will trigger the right to the voucher. So if the employer does not issue the, the uh, qualifying uh, return to work job, uh, uh, that's, that's the second requirement. The third requirement is that the employee does not actually return to work uh, for a period of 60 days following the end of temporary disability. So those are the major requirements um, to, to be eligible for a voucher. Uh, as you can see, it has nothing to do with any qualified injured, you know, worker language. Um, so how does an employer avoid uh, uh, giving the voucher? Like it was said before that they have to uh, offer a job, which is a, a, you know, a particular job has to meet certain requirements. We can get into that. And the employer, uh, once they offer the job, whether they, if the employer accepts the job, the employer the employee goes back to work voucher. If he rejects the job, then there's no voucher because he he declined the opportunity to return to work to return to work with the employer. So, uh, uh, so then the the question then is what you know what what type of job needs to be to be uh, uh, offered. Um, so the type of job is. is you know, set forth in the in the labor code, and uh, basically for pre and post January 2013 dates of injury, the the conditions are that the employee must be physically able to perform the essential job functions uh, of the job being offered. Uh, he's got to be able to actually do the job, whether that's his regular job, a some kind of a modif modified job, or an al alternative job. Uh, also, the job must be a regular position that lasts at least 12 months. Uh, uh, and the, th the third requirement is that the job must be within 15% of the wages previously paid uh, that their worker was making at the time of the injury. So they they have it can be it can be less money, but it but it can only be uh, reduced by percent. And also, the job must be within a reasonable commute distance from the home of the worker at the time of the injury. So those are the uh, things to look out for uh, when the job is being offered. So sometimes if, you know, if, you're, if your employer, your employer, your employee only has a, a certain, I think uh, 30 days to, you know, accept or not uh, to accept the position being offered. So you can get in a bind sometimes if the, if there's no response, uh, within that 30 days, because the, if no response by the employee to accept the job being offered, it's deemed to be rejected. So then you have to get into whether the job being offered was actually, you know, a, a proper a proper job meeting the criteria that we just went over. So a lot of times you have to, to look fully at that, uh, that great, the, the, uh, the job being offered and determine whether you have an out if someone d does respond uh, late. Uh, uh, one one point uh, to remember is that an employer cannot uh, offer a job and add hours to make up for that uh, of wages. The, 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 it's not the working hours aren't aren't in play here. It's just the hourly amount. So uh, and then another uh, tricky thing about the post two thousand pre two thousand thirteen pre two thousand thirteen vouchers is that once you go through this dance of uh, returning to work, not returning to work at the end of TD, uh, you don't get your voucher right then. You have to wait to the end of the case to get the voucher, because the voucher doesn't have to be issued by the employer until uh, uh, the end of the case. Uh, so we have twenty five days from the uh, the issuance of an award of permanent disability to issue the voucher. Um, and this is kind of ties in with, with, with the value of the voucher because the voucher uh, for these older cases uh, range between four and $10,000 uh, depending on the level of the permanent disability that was actually awarded. So in fact, you wouldn't even know what the value of the voucher was until you uh, did get your award. Um, a nice thing about the pre-2013 vouchers is that they uh, 
there was no time limit for using the voucher. Uh, but you heard Moises just talk about the fact that, you know, that the, the problem where the vouchers expire in two years. So the vouchers for dates of injury after January 1, 2013 do have, a, a, you know, a limitation of two years from the issuance of the voucher or five years from the date of injury, so wh whichever one's later. So if you have a case that goes on and on, you know, the, 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 the worker can, can take advantage of that extra time. Uh, vouchers issued before January 2013 can be settled as part of a, 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 as part of the case in uh, the case underlying case. Uh, they changed that, uh, and now the vouchers issued after January 2013 they cannot be settled uh, typically. Uh, but uh, the the Beltron case does allow a, a settlement of the voucher uh, where there's a good faith dispute regarding the uh, underlying compensability of the claim. It's kind of like the old uh, Thomas language that we put in uh, in the old uh, cases of vocational rehabilitation. So uh, we call it, I guess you call that Beltron language. So we can settle it in, in certain circumstances. Um, so and then if we move to vouchers after for dates of injury after January 1, 2013, uh, there were some changes made to the vouchers. The first thing is that the, now the voucher uh, doesn't have this gradation of payments. It's a voucher that can be valued up to $6,000. Uh, uh, and then there are certain requirements on what the money can be used for. And, and Nadia touched on a little bit of that earlier, the $1,000 for a computer, et cetera. Uh, there's a limitation as to what amount the vocational counselors can receive. It's basically 10% of that. So the most a counselor would be able to receive for working with your client would be $600. Under um, the voucher. The eligibility. Is, go ahead. No, I was saying under the voucher. Okay. I always get asked, well, is that aside from the voucher? Yeah. It's yeah. within the voucher of $6,000. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, and so the eligibility of a for, for a voucher is also changed. So, uh, so a worker suffering from permanent disability, that's one the requirement again, is it gets a voucher unless the employer uh, makes an offer of qualifying work within 60 days. Uh, so have, the employer has 60 days to offer work now, but the, the trigger for the 60 days is after receipt of a physician's return to work and voucher report, which is a report issued by uh, typically by the, the uh, PTP, QME, AME. Uh, it's just, it's a, there's a form, it's a DWC 10133.36 form that is completed. Uh, so if the employer does not make an offer of qualifying work uh, within that uh, 60 day period, then uh, they have to issue a voucher within 20 days after the 60 day period's expired, they have 20 days to, to, uh, to deliver the voucher. Um, the job that they, the, the job that they offer, alternative work, modified work, or even regular duty uh, is the same as uh, prior to 2013. Uh, same, uh, uh, you know, commute distance, 15% uh, of the, uh, less salary, et cetera. Um, so once again, though, if the worker uh, gets an offer, uh, they have 30 days from receipt of the offer to either accept or reject the offer. If they don't respond again, they're deemed to have uh, uh, rejected it, and uh, then there's no voucher. So uh, uh, pr prior to 2013, again, you had the 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 trigger was the end of temp temporary disability. Subsequent to January 2013, uh, the MMI status controls the uh, controls the process. Um, so the physician to return to work and voucher re report form is a form that is uh, called a mandatory attachment to the you know the QME uh, report, 
and it's supposed to be completed by the first report finding MMI, either by the treating physician, the AME, the QME, uh, and it's, it's a required a required form. Uh, and the form uh, basically lays out what the worker's restrictions are, uh, you know, that they have permanent disability and they have restrictions. And the idea is that the, the employer is then able to to refer to this uh, return to work form and offer appropriate uh, regular, you know, regular work, alternative work, or modified work. So, uh, one point about this is that uh, oftentimes cases settle before there's a MMI report issued. So, if you have, it could be even someone who has significant disability. But if if that if you settle a case before you get uh, a finding of permanent disability and before you get the physician to return to work for him, you know, you could be in a bind and, and, and your client would not get the voucher uh, unless you had the foresight of uh, negotiating that as part of the settlement or uh, otherwise you'd be, you could be potentially be out of luck. So it's something to remember when you do settle a case before you have the final reports in your case. Uh, another, another, Good point about the, uh, about the vouchers, and we commented on earlier, is that you can get them before the end of your case. Once you're the client's MMI, you can uh, get your client the, the 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 voucher. He can get his five thousand dollars, and uh, you know some of these cases drag on, and uh, uh, you know after a couple of years uh, uh, in, in being involved in these cases, the the five thousand dollar return to work money, for example, uh, uh, has a great appeal. So that's something also to keep in mind. Uh, so, uh, another, another thing to remember is when you do write your adequacy letter to the QME, AME, you should include the physician's return to work form, uh, so that they have it. And you should ask them to complete the form, uh, because you're going to need that to get your voucher. Uh, the, the, you know, the defense, I don't know, I think probably about half the time they'll, they'll, They'll include include that form and ask uh, uh, ask ask that it be completed. I find uh, frequently that I even get objections from defendants when I try to submit that report because they 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 want they don't want to they don't want to see all the restrictions. So uh, you know they're worried that the case is ended up in the hands of a, a LaBeouf case or something. But so but anyway that that report the form obviously is a proper document to send to the evaluating physician, they're, they're supposed to fill it out. So then the issue arises, what happens uh, where the doctor doesn't complete the form? Because I've seen that happen frequently. Um, so the doctor, QME, issues a, a, a MMI report, includes restrictions, but does not include the physician's return to work and voucher report. The case settles. So what do you do then? Well, there is one case, it's uh, Opus One Labs versus WCAB, and the gentleman's name is F N D K Y A N. I don't know how that is pronounced. It's uh, 84 CCC 634 writ denied case uh, panel decision. So in that case, the uh, the panel uh, found that the applicant was entitled to a voucher, even where the physician's return to work form was not completed by the QME and was not delivered to the employer. So in that case, the uh, QME had issued a report finding the applicant to be at maximum medical improvement with permanent disability, had identified the applicant's work restrictions, but the doctor did not issue the physician's return to work form. Uh, so the WCAB found that the form you know, is a mandatory attachment to a medical report and it serves to identify the restrictions to enable the employer to properly evaluate the return to work. Uh, uh, but the board awarded the voucher uh, over overturning the uh, trial judge and ordered the voucher anyway, because it, it found that the QME report in itself, in this particular case uh, was sufficient uh, it, ha it had indicated that the applicant had permanent disability and also provided the work restrictions. And uh, the board pointed out that the uh, defendant actually has the burden 
to obtain the form after being put on notice of the QME's finding of uh, permanent disability and work restrictions. If and I can pipe to do otherwise would place form over substance. Yeah, go if ahead. I can, if I can pipe in here again, also if you look at the statute. It, as you mentioned, the statute says that it's a mandatory form for the purpose of informing the employer. It's not a mandatory form for the purpose of determining eligibility for the voucher. So I think the case is correct, as you mentioned, that it says, hey, defendants, if you really want the form and you think it's mandatory, you, you make sure you get it done. But I don't think that form is necessary at all. The report should be adequate. And again, if, if you're ever stuck the language in the statute tells you that the form is mandatory solely for the purpose of informing the employer, and uh, it should not yeah, preclude the applicant point. from getting his benefit. All right. So, and I only have a few other comments. Uh, one is that uh, the statute provides that the employer does not have liability uh, for injury to the employee while utilizing the voucher. So there's no lead need for any language to protect the employer from, you know, vocational rehabilitation injuries. Uh, and also one last point is that when you do get into a voucher dispute, it used to be the, you always might want to help me out on this, but there used to be, or there still is uh, a direction that you're supposed to go to the administrative director first, but that has been overturned. And now these disputes go straight to the uh, workers comp board. Uh, you can correct me if I'm wrong about that. That's absolutely correct. I've, I've, I've never gone to the administrative director. I've always gone directly to the WCAB because it seemed a wasted step. The regulation uses the word may, and I always argued in any event that the regulation exceeded the authority uh, provided by the statute. And that is actually an in bank decision that came back down last year. That's Anthony Dennis versus State of California, Department of Cor uh, Corrections and Rehabilitation. It's 85 Cal Comp cases, 389, and they basically invalidated the regulation 10133.54 because it exceeded the statutory authority granted the administrative director under Labor Code Section 4658.5C and 4658.58. Point seven H, which is the first one is the uh, voucher statute for pre-2013. The second uh, statute is the statute for post-2013. Uh, and it restricts the exclusive adjudicar adjudicatory power of the WCAB to adjudicate claims, which includes the voucher. Uh, on that, I think right. uh, the issue with the supplemental payment, you might be able to use this case and some of the language in this case to argue you might be able to get two uh, 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 supplemental payments from the state, but that's a separate issue. Uh, the Dennis case, people know it mainly because it was the uh, uh, person was injured while they were an inmate in uh, one of our uh, state hotels and uh, they were offered to go back to work. <laughs> at the state hotel. And that was not a bona fide offer. It has good language that you can use when someone's been terminated or uh, they're arguing that they're not being taken back to work because uh, of some good cause termination or because of some safety reasons. That's a good end bond case has good decision. So Moises, uh, we had a question that uh, if the injured worker doesn't accept the offer because the injured worker knows the employer does not have modified duties, does that still qualify the injured worker to a voucher? What I do in that instance or where the applicant is still treating and they've offered the voucher based on the QME report and the applicant is still actively treating and there may be disputed body parts still, I usually uh, put uh, that we accept the voucher once the treating doctor and QME have looked at a job description of the job and have signed off on it. And that typically keeps the door open. And I have yet to have a problem when I've done that, that they say, no, you, uh, and even under the old where you would get the 15% bump down if you didn't accept the modified or 
regular offer of work. I, I put it that it's acceptable based on that they will get a report from the treating doctor, the QME, reviewing the job description and specifically saying it's medically reasonable. All right. Thank you, Moises. So, so John, have a few more uh, case law to review with us. Is that right? Yeah, well, th there was yeah. some questions that you guys come came up with. Uh, what disability percentage does it take to get a voucher? Again, look at the, the, the language of both vouchers. It says partial, permanent disability, partial disability. You don't, all you need is one-tenth of one percent to get the voucher. QIW doesn't matter. The doctor could say that you are QIW. The person could have gone back to work. They've actually could be doing the same job, but if they didn't do the right steps as required by the statute that they made the offer, they could be back at the same job and still get a voucher. They can be back at a modified job and still get a voucher. Uh, but as far as the percentage of disability, it, it, it's less than 1%. I'll give you an example on a voucher I got recently. Uh, the client had uh, a knee injury, went off work for about a year at a hotel, went back for about four months, couldn't do that work, left, went to a construction job for about six months, and then two months, another construction job. QI, uh, the QME eventually found apportionment of his back, which, which a compensable consequence, to the construction job where he worked uh, six months. The total back was 6%. He apportioned 6% of 6%, which is 0.3% uh, disability, and he got a voucher. So on three-tenths of 1%, he's entitled to a voucher. Uh, so it, uh, it, uh, it doesn't, uh, once you have any partial permanent disability, the trigger point, there is, as I think uh, Anthony was mentioning, is different on the two statutes. On the pre-2013, you have to have an award. So typically you're not gonna get that till you either uh, CNR'd it or FNA'd it. And, and by the language you put in there that you get the voucher or the percentage in a STIP and award automatically entitles you to a voucher. Uh, you are entitled to a voucher as to each injury. There's two cases on that. There's the silver case for the pre-2013 uh, statute. The case is Silva versus LSG Sky Sheets 215 Cal Work Comp PD Lexus page 406 and basically the case says based on the clear statute of the language, you're entitled to a voucher for each injury that results in partial permanent disability. In this case, the injury was a specific 2010 injury uh, to the left shoulder and a CT that also covered the same left shoulder, cervical spine and psych and a CT that covered those same body parts with a left wrist added, 25% PD on one case, 30% PD on the other uh, case, uh, you got uh, the two vouchers. There's good language in that case about double recovery, that it doesn't represent a double recovery. So if you ever get that argument, there's good uh, language in that Silva case. In the post-2013 uh, statute, it's the Cessna, S-E-S-E-N-A versus resident in by Marriott. That's at a 2017 case at Cal Work Comp PD Lexus 320. Again, there was a specific, uh, 2014 specific with 12% PD and a CT that went through 2015 with 37% PD. And you get a voucher for each injury based on the clear and plain language of Labor Code Section 4658.7. So if you... I've gotten two vouchers as a routine basis now for the last five or six years. I have yet to get three. Um, when I try to get three, you get a lot of resistance and I've sort of compromised <laughs> in part of the, part of the uh, CNR. So uh, I've yet to get three, but to, 
technically you're entitled to three, four, five. Those workers that uh, that continue working after this injury and this injury and this injury, and we're getting screwed by Benson. Well, if you add up four or five vouchers, that's going to be a 25. And especially if a couple are under the old PD system where you might get an eight or $10,000 voucher, uh, you get $25,000, $30,000 for a vocational program. That's something that can really help somebody. Well, this is a question came in regarding uh, so regarding Dennis. It says, so according to Dennis, I don't need to submit the issue of the voucher to the AD first before asking the intervention of the board. Never go to the AD. Never, <laughs> ever go to the AD unless you're getting paid for your time by your client per hour up front or as you're going. Never go to the AD. It's a wasted step. She said uh, she had a situation in which the judge first asked uh, her to submit the dispute to the AD. And then depending on the AD's response to file a DOR. No, that's what a lot of judges did. And um, I had a lot of resistance four or five years ago initially when I went directly to the WCAB and the judge is going, well, you know, the AD has jurisdiction. I go, no, they don't. It says May and I get to choose. May means it's it's voluntary and it's a waste of time. And typically I want to, I would set that issue for trial, whether I had to go to the AD first. So if you get a judge telling you that you got to go to the AD first, tell them, judge, I want a trial on that issue and tell them to read Dennis. Well, what, what, what we used to do, what we... What we used to do is submit it to the uh, AD and also file for a hearing at the board at the same time. And you're right, it's a waste of time, but we would then say, well, we, we did submit it to the AD and they didn't respond or, or whatever. Uh, if they came out against you, it doesn't matter. You still you know, get to the WCAB at, at that point. So, but we don't do that anymore. We just go straight to the board. And there were some prior cases, I think, where someone had gone to the AD and then blew the so-called time limit to so-called appeal the AD determination. I, it's in the back of my mind, but it was a couple years ago. And the board said, eh, we got jurisdiction. You know, we'll decide this. So it, yeah. it's a waste of time to go to the AD. It, it, it really is. It really is. I agree. It's another question. It says, should we be submitting the job description to the PTP in the beginning or when we are at the stages of a QME, AME? What's the difference between the return to work and the RU-91 form? The RU-91 form really doesn't exist anymore because uh, there's no rehab unit. Uh, so although those, um, the old, job description form that they used, I think the RU-103 or whatever it was, actually was a better one that they have now uh, under the a AD, whatever, 1,000, whatever the number is uh, for the job description. But it's important generally to give your doctor a good job description, uh, period, especially on a CT. I mean, it's absolutely crucial on a CT that your doctor have an adequate job description so you should give it to them immediately. In the, in, and if we're asking our, our doctor to write a report saying there's a CT where a QME has said, oh, I don't think there's a CT, it's all gonna depend on that job description, which doctor carries the, the better water will be the one that has the better job description. I, I just deposed a QME that, uh, washed my client out, I'm gonna go and file a request for replay or to have him stricken. Uh, 20 year employee, uh, commercial seamstress uh, doing heavy stuff has a six level fusion of her thoracic spine. And the doctor says no CT because there's no doctor report from a industrial clinic. And then I go start going through the job description, which is two sentences. And his response was, well, she wasn't forthcoming. And I guess I wasn't inquisitive enough. I think, thank you, doctor. Your report is full of, uh, full of junk and we're gonna strike you. The job description is crucial. 
And the earlier you get it to the doctor, the better off you are. Did you review uh, any cases relating to people who have resigned from their employment or been terminated with or without cause, uh, or maybe their immigration status doesn't prevent the employer from uh, offering uh, 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 qualified work? I, the, the only case I, that comes to mind is a recent case of Sadlack. It's uh, University of California, Berkeley versus WCAB. Uh, it's 85 Cal Comp cases, 311. And the reason that this sort of uh, folds into the voucher, this is a lady that had gone back to modified work. They actually had offered her modified work and she went back to modified work, but then had a new and further uh, and f I think even filed a petition for new and further, and then had another PNS report. And I think this case stands for the proposition that if you get subsequent PNS reports, for example, from the treating doctor, or then a QME, I think they have to off make the, the, the voucher provisions kick in again. And this one had to do with the bump up and bump down. Uh, and again, whether uh, she eventually retired, and whether that retirement took her out of that uh, the provision where she'd be entitled to a voucher. Uh, she's entitled to a voucher because there was evidence that her retirement was partially due to her industrial injuries. I have a very similar case up. I'm waiting for the judge's decision. Again, it's a UCSB case, very similar, where they uh, are trying to get the 15% uh, reduction in her uh, in in her PD and uh, not give her the voucher because they had offered her modified work and she took the modified work, but she had to retire within nine months because she couldn't do it anymore. So that's a really good case it's, and really good discussion about uh, when the duty to provide the uh, modified and uh, uh, and alternative work offer is needed. The rest of the cases that we looked at pretty much have to deal with uh, with penalties and when you're entitled to penalties on a voucher. The typical situation that you have is you see and are the case and you put in there that you have that you have a right to the voucher or that a voucher will be provided. That is crucial that you put it in there because then it becomes an award. If you don't put it in there, the type of penalty that you get will be limited. All right. The other thing, uh, issue that comes up, and I got this trial coming up next week, is I have a, a, a defendant that didn't provide a voucher. I have a CNR that says they got to provide a voucher. We send three letters, they don't provide a voucher. I file a DOR to force them to provide a voucher. They finally provide a voucher. At the hearing, they say we provided a voucher. We're not, uh, can't be hit with a penalty because she hasn't used the voucher. Well, you just gave it to her last week. You know, how could she use it? Well, she needs to use it before we, uh, we can be dinged with a penalty. And they're partially right in looking at, at the cases. The most recent case that's come down in this area is a Robbins versus Domino's Pizza. It's a 2020 case, CalComp PD at 196. Uh, Judge Rosen Rosenfeld up in uh, in uh, Van Nuys did it, and uh, the panel was Sweeney, Zelensky, and uh, and Snelling. And right off the bat, she notes. The WCAB has exclusive jurisdiction to determine eligibility to receive the voucher based on Dennis. All right. So defense were arguing she didn't have jurisdiction. Okay. Then they argued that it was moot because they had provided the voucher. And they did so voluntarily because they are such good people because the voucher wasn't written into the CNR. And there was a dispute because the only doctor that said 
She was entitled to a voucher that gave her partial permanent disability, was a non-MPN doctor. Well, they disposed of that, that, you know, the report's admissible, it can be based on a non-MPM doctor. And in order for defendants not to be dinged with a penalty, they had the burden of proving that they had a genuine reasonable doubt regarding their liability to provide a voucher. So the WC Bay, uh, ordered a penalty and fees. Uh, the applicant attorney had asked for uh, sanctions, but no sanctions were provided as the judge thought not necessary because I guess she gave enough on fees. Uh, the case had been settled in 2017. No mention of, of the voucher in there. Excuse me. Yeah, there was the voucher. Eight months later, they provide the voucher. And they were given the penalties and the fees on that one. There's a case that came down two years ago, Baugh versus Action Clothing, 2018, CalWorks Comp PD Lexus 370. The workers' comp judge found that the defendant unreasonably delayed the voucher, so they provided a 25% penalty under 5814 and attorney's fees under Labor Code 5814.5 in the amount of $1,500. However, the voucher had not been part of the CNR, was not addressed in the CNR. So therefore, the attorney's fees were taken off because they were not enforcing an award. So get it into your CNR or uh, your STIP that they're going to provide a voucher. And that way it's an award and you'll get attorney's fees. A case that came down in 2017 and this one, these next uh, three cases, there's three cases that have a lot of discussion that are used by defendants a lot because they raise some, some good issues. And the main issue in all three of these, and it's the McFarland case, the Fuentes case, and the Portugal versus Mikasa case, they raise an issue that when the person has not used the voucher, how can you assess a penalty when you don't know what the proper amount of penalty is? And in a couple of these cases, they figured that the voucher was 6000 I think another one, the voucher was 8000 and they assessed a $2,000 penalty on the $8,000 voucher and a $1,500 penalty on the $6,000 voucher. Well, the argument was, what if they don't use the voucher at all? What if they don't use the, uh, only use half of it? And you gave them a $2,000 penalty, which is more than 25%, or you gave them a $1,500 penalty on a $6,000 voucher that only 3,000 was used. So the way the board has dealt with it is, that the penalty issues and it's for 25% of whatever the amount of the voucher that eventually is used to be adjusted by the parties once it's used. And there's some discussion there. And I would think that the proper way, once the penalty has been issued, that when they put in the request for reimbursement, they would have to add a 25% penalty to each one of those checks or there might be an issue of a second penalty. <clears throat> Wonderful. So, those, so those sites are McFarland versus Redlands Unified School District, 2017, CalWork Comp PD Lexus 495, Fuentes versus Cheesecake Factory 216, CalWork Comp uh, PD Lexus 286, Portugal versus Mikasa, 2009, Cal Work Comp PD Lexus 143. Uh, there's a few other cases, but if you read those cases, it'll cite the other cases. And pretty much, you still should go forward, get a finding that you're entitled to the penalty, and then they'll have to be adjusted by the parties later. If you have it, in your F, uh, F and A that the voucher should be provided or your CNR 
that a voucher will be provided. You'll get fees in addition to the penalty under 58.14.5. Uh, if it's not, your fee will be 15% of whatever the penalty is. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you guys for participating. Um, we're at our time limit. This has been uh, a great time, great information, great value, hope for our audience. Um, Moisius, Anthony, thank you for your time. I, uh, I suppose um, you're easy to get a hold of. Um, if you're not, uh, then uh, uh, anybody can contact us at Gemini and we'll pass on information. Um, uh, I also want to mention, um, unfortunately, our panelist, John Hernandez, he had a, an accident. He's fine. Uh, no broken bones. He twisted his ankle. Um, we're, we miss him and uh, wish him well. Um, this has been a, a great, a great uh, webinar. It's pan uh, this is strategies for using vouchers to help your law practice. And uh, thank you, audience, for participating. Thank you, Dan. Thank you.